experts out there that are just like, you know, freaking grinding their teeth right now and cursing our names saying we don't know what we're talking about. But. Welcome to the Hunt Pack Country podcast presented by Exo Mountain Gear. This is episode 109, and it's going to be a bit different. Just Steve and I tonight, we got back within the last couple of weeks from the Archery Trade Association show, so we're going to talk about the new bows, the new gear that's hitting the market for this year, and also talk about some of the trends that we're seeing in the industry, and why some of this is good, and maybe some of this you shouldn't be too concerned about. You know, it's always fun to talk gear, but there's kind of a downside to that, which we talk about a little bit. We also get into some listener Q&A, answering your questions. Just want to remind you guys, because we want to do more of these episodes in the future. If you have questions, whether that's hunting, tactic-related, gear-related, or pretty much anything else, just shoot us an email to podcast at xmmountgear.com. We will consider those questions for future episodes. A couple more quick things before we roll into this one. One is we have the training program from our friends at Atomic Athlete. You can only get it through us at one place. Just go to xomountaingear.com forward slash train. A free download training plan that's progressing. It will get you in shape specifically for backcountry hunting. It's a great resource. Also, just want to remind you guys, we do a discount for law enforcement, uh, military, and other first responders. If you guys qualify for that, and are interested in Exomountain Gear packs or other gear, just shoot me an email directly to mark at xomountaingear.com. We will get you set up with that discount, and thank you guys so much for your service to protect our freedom, to watch our backs, and to do everything that you guys do for us. Finally, a big announcement. We're starting to roll out some 2018 stuff. Just sent out a newsletter today announcing that we are offering First Light Fusion across the Exomountain Gear lineup for 2018. So we are going to be shipping these packs in March. We are not going to do pre-orders. We're going to wait till we have all the inventory built up so we can ship right away. But just wanted to let you, the podcast listeners, know about that. Exciting stuff having Fusion in the lineup for 2018. If you guys want to know when that stuff launches and other future updates like this product release, make sure you are an XO Insider and you get our newsletters. Just go to xomountaingear.com forward slash newsletter. We don't send you a bunch of junk, but we let you know about important product updates as well as some great content, giveaways, and other things from some of our friends. All right, let's roll into this episode 109. As always, guys, thank you for joining us. Steve, what is happening, man? Not much. It's uh, middle of show season, middle of January here. I got the just got back from ATA show, which we'll talk about here tonight, and then leave for SHOT Show on Tuesday, so two days from now, and then fly straight from Vegas to, to Denver for the Outdoor Retailer Show, and <laughs> back home, and then off to Hunt Expo in Salt Lake, and then I'll be there for a couple of days, and then fly over to the Portland Sportsman's Expo Saturday and Sunday to be there. So, it's um, man, this time of year is uh, a lot of fun, but it's, uh, you know, you're a lot, of crazy. a lot of airports, a lot of shaking hands, and uh, everyone's sick. I've, I've personally been sick for the last three weeks, basically. So, um, yeah, I, I guess that's good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, for sure. So, I mean, we wanted to, we have a bunch of episodes we could release that we've already recorded, but we just kind of uh, really touch base with you guys, the listeners in this crazy time of year and talk about a few things, uh, answer some of your questions as well. We haven't done a Q and A episode in a long freaking time, so that's overdue. And we'll hit just a few of those, but also wanted to throw that out there for you listeners, maybe some of the newer listeners that we're picking up all the time. If you have any questions, uh, send them to podcast at exomountaingear.com, and we will do some Q and As, uh, you know, this winter into the spring, going into preseason. So if you have questions about gear or hunts or what have you. It could either end up being in a Q&A episode with Steve and I, or it's also great fuel for uh, guests that we can get on that are better experts than the two of us might be in certain topics. That's for dang sure. Um, but yeah, let's get started. We're just, uh, gosh, I guess like a week and a half coming off of ATA show, um, which is, you know, kind of a private industry show for anything archery related. So it covers certainly everything bow hunting, but also target archery and uh, gosh, just Anything you can think of archery related with that. So it, it, I just thought it'd be fun. You know, all of the brand new 2018 bows are always there. You get to shoot everything, you get to walk around and see, you know, 
more gear and gizmos and gadgets than you can imagine. So debrief on that. Just let's hit with the bows first, Steve. Um, you know, we both have history with elite archery years ago, and then also with Hoyt more recently with carbon defiance. And I thought it was interesting from my perspective, really going into this year with like zero agenda and just shooting everything. Like for me, those were the the top two that I came to as well as some others. But what did you find with shooting all the bows that you got to shoot, Steve? Yeah, I, I think I shot the top, oh, I'd say six or seven brands, you know, um, and their top flagship model from each one. You know, I, I mean, I've, I've probably said this for the last 10 years. Uh, as far as accuracy is concerned, any quality bow is going to shoot way better than, than the shooter is going to shoot, right? Um, you know, get some might tune a little bit faster or bounce a little bit better, but big picture, you know, you're trying to hit the vitals on an elk at 60 yards. Any equal is going to be more than adequate to get the job done. It really comes down to feel and preferences. And, um, you know, some, you might just have like, uh, you might think Hoyt is a cooler company than, than Bowtech. So you want to shoot, but you know, it's, uh, a lot of it just, it's, it comes down to stuff like that. Um, there, yeah, so I, you know, Hoyt, Matthews, uh, the new Elite, the Bowtech, shot a PSE, um, shot the Obsession, shot the Prime. All of them had, like, you know, they're all really dang nice bows. Um, the, uh, I'm trying to think, um, the new Elite, their Ritual was pretty interesting because they basically took all the dampeners off of it and they're claiming uh, really high, like 89, 90% efficiency coming out of that. So basically, all the energy that's stored in the draw force curve um, as you're drawing back, 90% of that, that is making it into the arrow, uh, which basically equates to, you know, not necessarily a faster bow per se, but you can have a really smooth drawing bow that shoots uh, faster than the next bow that felt the same as far as that draw was concerned. So I was super impressed with that. Remind me of kind of the, the older elites that we used to shoot. Um, super impressed with the Hoyts. Uh, I'm a little, you know, my uh, target panic struggles are probably well known to anybody who follows the podcast, and and a six inch brace height bow kind of scares me. Um, you know, I like like a 33, 34, seven inch brace height is kind of my sweet spot, and and uh, this new RX one, which I had one show up at the shop the other day, like a, a 31, 31 ATA with a six inch brace height. Um, so I'm gonna set it up and shoot it for a couple months and and see how it compares to my carbon defiant because. I really have no bones to pick about that bow. I shot it uh, as well as I could shoot. Uh, it's quiet. It's lightweight. Uh, it's a great bow. So, um, trying to think what else that. It's funny. I the trend. You know, there's still a little bit of trend for speed, but obviously that's much less of a priority. The as far as like what companies are designing and marketing for. Um, but you see, you see it coming up now more so in just bow balance. Uh, Hoy came out with their the the new uh, Redworks, a wider. Uh, limb set at the bottom so basically the there's more mass weight down there which helps balance the bow better i think matthews is doing that with uh the grip placement if i believe correctly um and i think everyone's kind of focusing on, on balance you know i think we're pretty maxed out on what we're what you can do as far as speed and efficiencies go um out of the materials that are being used right now until someone develops some a ultra light carbon limb that can handle everything or whatever. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I think it's just picking. They're, they're focusing on balance. So yeah, um, yeah. It's but uh, yeah. Overall, I was super impressed with just about everything. Yeah, I mean, it was one of those things where you go and most of the bows you shoot, you can pick out something you really, really like about it. Like there's so much mm-hmm. good out there. Um, at the same time, there was nothing to me. And I'm not saying this to knock anybody. I think it's just an interesting point in the industry where it's like the bows are so good, but they've been so good for a few years now. And so it's like, yeah, for right. me, it's like, you know, if you're shooting a one-year-old bow, two-year-old bow, three-year-old bow, um, not to say that nothing's improved, but gosh, those are still great bows. And so this whole mindset of like upgrading every year, yeah. um, for me, it's... It's like, I don't know. Like, I just want to stick with what I have and what works. Yeah. And obviously not everybody's in the position where they want to upgrade every year. But um, I've done that for the past, gosh, six, seven years simply because I've had the opportunity to. And this year I'm like, man, I don't know. My Carbon Defiance 
awesome. And there's a lot of awesome bows out <laughs> right. there, but I just don't know if I want to go through the headache of starting from scratch this year, you know? Yeah, no, I hear you for sure. It's kind of a, you know, the, um, the bow market is a perfect example of that. Uh, the, the, co- basically the companies start doing it first, right? Company A and company B are competing and company A comes out with a, starts coming out with a new model every single year. And then company B has to start doing that to compete. And then the customer starts expecting something new and revolutionary every year, um, and it just becomes this vicious cycle. Now it's to the point like if you jump on archery the day after like Hoyt releases a new bow, there's probably you know 50 people out there like oh it's awesome, and 50 people out there slamming them because they like they didn't completely re wheel and this isn't that big of a change. And it's kind of like yeah. you have to set some realistic expectations on what's actually going to happen and in the span of one year, you know? Right. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, the bow companies, I mean, these guys, every year they're cranking out new models. And people's expectations are higher and higher and higher. And, and really, you know, I, I guess I kind of alluding to earlier, they kind of hit the ceiling on where they can go, at least in my opinion. Um, you know, there's going to be some material changes and I'm sure something that comes down the road and some, you know, radical new design that does something to, to boost this or that. But as far as accuracy goes, yeah, they're all just freaking right there. Yeah. So speaking of uh, a radical and new, uh, one of the products that you know we looked at and talked about personally, <laughs> and then really was this kind of theme uh, in some subtle and some not so subtle ways for the show. First, we'll sit on this Garmin site. So a Garmin bow site with built-in rangefinder and uh, digital pins, basically. And then we saw. Uh-huh that uh, IQ had a bow sight, more with traditional pins, but with a built-in uh, range finder. And then there was several, um, for lack of better term, mom and pop uh, companies, small kind of startups that were really trying to do the same thing in some different ways. Some were simply just range finders. Um, we saw some quote unquote sites that were nothing that you think of in terms of a bow sight. It was literally an LCD or LED, either way, display with a video feed. So you're superimposing something over what your bow is quote-unquote seeing, and that's how you're shooting, which was crazy. Um, There were some sites that had movable pins that you did not control as the shooter, but you range find something, and then the pin drops to that range. So it's a um, a physical mechanical pin that would go up and down based off of what you range and where that pin should be for that range target. So there's this whole kind of stream of things. And, uh, from everything we saw, Garmin was certainly at the forefront of this and executed it best in terms of attempting to have, uh, gosh, a whole new era in bow designs and range finding and integration and technology. So, for guys that didn't see this yet, uh, Steve, give us the scoop on the Garmin site and kind of what you thought of it. Yeah, I mean, it, it, you hit it pretty well. It's basically, um, it's a, it looks like a traditional archery site, like a Black Gold Ascent or something like that. Um, but it has a rangefinder built in. It's got like a, a little bit you know beefier housing. Um, got the rangefinder built in, and there's a little wire with a button um, that you basically would come down on near your grip about where your index finger would be. And so... And you just, I think you basically just tape that button to your handle. Um, and you simply draw, point, um, and push the button, and it's going to range for you. And then it has uh, these little LED lights, I believe, or LCD light, LCD, yeah, that reflect onto a piece of glass in there uh, and, and basically puts the pin where you need to shoot. Um, and it's, it's pretty, <laughs> I mean, it's pretty incredible when you think about it. How, how well that's working. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of uh, discussion that's come up on this. Obviously, anytime something this radically new comes to market, you know, there's going to be people that jump jump right on the bandwagon and people that, uh, you know, say it's the end of all hunting and there's no ethics and fair chase involved in this. Um, and it's a really, um, it's a really tough topic. And I think you could argue both sides of this pretty well. Um, it's, uh, I, I think they, people don't quite understand the site. Uh, I know, know one of the guys who was an engineer to help design it. And, uh, um, you know, we got to talk to him and, and he was really like all about like this will increase the ethics of hunting and that you 
will there will be less lost animals right you're not gonna have to guess ranges uh if you know an elk comes in and he's at 40 yards and he takes a few steps away and also he's at 44 but you're still shooting for 40 you know you may hit low and wound that elk or something like that and in this scenario you're not going to you're gonna make a lethal shot assuming you do your part as far as executing the shot um so it's you know i think you could really easily argue there's gonna be a lot less wounded animals a lot less guessing of range um it's a tough, tough one. You know, how do you like, I mean, the, the most basic ones like a fixed blade broadhead versus an expandable broadhead. I mean, that's widely accepted now, um, except for a few Western states of expandables. And I think it's a pretty, um, I've always argued, um, you know, I have to shoot fixed blades because I'm here in Idaho. Uh, and there's a chance a mechanical broadhead will fail, right? I mean, a poorly designed one may not open up. But I think if you actually did a study on people that are going out into the field with properly tuned broadhead arrow setups with fixed blade broadheads, you know, they're going to be pretty erratic flight probably. Uh, and I think there'd be a lot less wounded animals just because people are going to be more accurate with uh, expand broadhead. So this site kind of lumps into that same conversation of uh, there's going to be less wounded animals. Maybe more will die because people won't miss, I guess. But um, there's <laughs> it's kind of an interesting where do you draw the line, you know, because technology is going to keep advancing and at some point you got to um, stop. Uh, I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I had I had all kinds of reactions to it when I first saw it. Um, and not about the product itself, but it's just kind of, it always strikes that little bit of uh, nerve in me where I'm like, well, how complicated do we need to make our bows? How expensive does this have to be? How many more mm -hmm. batteries do we need to add? And so, you know, I can see all <laughs> right. kinds of like so many uh, downsides to this, not from an ethical standpoint, but um, I'm just immediately thinking, you know, for a multi day backcountry mountain hunt, do I really want another electronic? And I think the answer is no. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at it and thinking, there's there are no physical pins to this thing. Like there is no backup if the battery mm -hmm. goes dead or if there's some electronic right. failure versus some of the, like the other sites where it's, yeah, there's a built in range finder, but there's still just like your standard mechanical physical pins. And I'm not saying that that's better. It's just different design. Right. Right. Um, so those are like all of my first thoughts. Um, but yeah, the more I thought about the ethics Man, I don't, I don't see too much there um, for most modern day hunters who are already using a laser rangefinder. So the right. difference is you're using the same technology. You're just making it easier and more accessible. Um, yeah, this is no different than a, a rangefinder pocket and a single pin slider that you've done the sight tape. And that, that was a thing, yeah. another point that Garmin didn't really let people know right away, and that the it's not like you go sight in 20 yards and you're done with this sight, right? Like it right. is no different than sighting in a sight tape. Yeah. And it even more so, it won't shoot past what you've sighted and confirmed. So sure. if you've only shot out to 70 yards, it will not give you a 74 yard pin. Like you have to confirm everything and go in there and sight it and tell it that's where a 70 your 74 yard pin hits. So right. um, I think that's a, a, a thing. A lot of people just assumed you could, you know, probably sight it in at 20 and then, you know, click something at 88 yards and it's going to show you the pin for it. You know, and that, yeah. that's definitely not the case. So like you said, it's making, um, it's just making things a little bit easier. You know, I, I know for me, uh, on my, my elk hunt, we recapped a little bit where that bull, you know, I had, I had range 50 yards and then he came in an opening and, and was standing there at 35 and I didn't have time to rearrange and I still just shot for 50. Not really, you know, I should have, yeah, hindsight on that one, but, uh, <laughs> Uh, shot over the back and I could have easily shot him through the spine and, and wounded that elk and and not recovered him so um, luckily enough I made you know the judgment was off that far that I shot over his back but um, yeah. you know it's uh yeah it's uh it's an interesting topic and I don't think there's um, I don't think anybody could come out there's just not enough um, like facts supporting one way or the other i don't think yeah. you could ever come out and say this is absolutely bad or this is absolutely great it's just uh you know it's that's that a whole you know shooting elk at a 90 yards with your bow some people are absolutely capable of it and, and other people have no business doing it and right. you can't draw uh, there's no such thing as a black and white line on how far is too far so yeah yeah and i don't stuff. i don't see this as a product that is making it easier to execute a shot 
it's giving yeah. you better information on the shot you need to execute, but it's not a product that's making it easier to execute the shot. Yep. Um, and so it's not really, you know, I go back to the, was well, this making it hunting too easy? Is it taking out the sport? Is it ruining fair chase, etc.? I don't see that this is doing this. Um, the more I've thought about it and had the time to process, I align with kind of what you were saying, kind of what you mentioned your buddy from Garmin was saying, if anything, this is just going to help make things more eth- ethical with yep. greater accuracy of shots. So, you know, we've, we've all been there most likely where we've been at full draw and want to rearrange, but we can't really let down and pick up a range finder. And this is yep. just a huge, huge asset to be able to be at full draw and rearrange. Um, and that's, that's huge. That's huge. So yeah, it's nothing absolutely. I'm, I'm going to be throwing on my bow anytime soon. Um, <laughs> but you know, yeah. it's, it's, yeah, it, it's a cool innovation to see for sure. Yeah. And like you said, I mean the, the whole battery thing scares the hell out of me. I mean, I'm the less crap I can have in my pack, especially electronic, um, the happier I seem to be. Um, but some things like, you know, add my Garmin in reach, uh, that's the best thing I've put in my pack in the last 10 years. So, um, and that is absolutely battery and electronics and technology. That's really improved the quality of my hunts. So yeah. it's, uh, you got to draw your own personal lines and, and, and I guess stick to it. Right. Yeah. This is, uh, probably off topic in terms of backcountry hunting, but one of the not like, I don't want to say like one of the coolest of the products at the show, but one of the things that stood out to me personally, and I saw some benefit from and was kind of anxious to get one in the coming year, especially as I'm going to be hunting more and more with my kids, is Primos had a pretty cool innovation on their ground blinds to where they basically have uh, a one-way fabric. So from the outside, it looks like your standard ground blind, all camouflage, but you get in the ground blind in that camouflage material that you normally can't see through that normally limits your field of view and reduces your vision to what you can see through the window you could actually see through this fabric and so it's almost like you're sitting there in the wide open like you pretty much have full view which if you've ever hunted from ground blind normally you know that you have what you can see through the window but you have all these blind spots and you can't always see something coming from this side or that side and your view is just very limited and so this new fabric that primos was building their blinds with from the inside looking out you could see and have this massive uh field of vision but then from the outside it was uh still really effective at being camouflage so that's something that you know doesn't relate to backcountry hunting but i didn't (laughs) didn't see that one yeah so what Obviously, does it still have a mesh window that you shoot through? Yeah, it still has windows okay. that you can have mesh shoot through or, you know, like full zip down, roll down, have them wide open. Okay. Um, yeah, it had all of that. But, yeah, the main, wow. like, body, like the front and the sides, um, it was almost, I mean, it wasn't as clear as looking through a window, but you could absolutely see everything see that was going it. on around you. Yeah, it was pretty was dang wild. cool. Huh. Yeah, pretty cool. So. Any other standout products for you? I mean, there's a few things that stick out. Some of the new stand releases were really dang cool. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, anything else stick out for you? You know, yeah, not really. Uh, <laughs> it was a, so there's everything. Um, I guess I'm kind of like uh, in my wise old age of 33. I've got like got the stuff that works for me, and yeah. and I, and I'm not. Uh, I remember, you know, like I said 10 years ago, I'd have been like all geeked out on every new little thing that was popping up and and wanted to try it. And now I'm kind of like, eh, I know it works for me. And so I guess I I wasn't kind of diving into every booth, checking out all the new products. Right. Um, we did see some cool stuff. Uh, Oh, oh, the new Nikon rangefinder. I forgot about that. That thing's incredible. Oh, so Um, I didn't check this out. So fill me in. Okay. So Nikon took their image stabilization that's in their cameras and put that into a rangefinder and it's incredible. Um, yeah, we, I was kind of blown away. We just stopped by their booth to kind of look at their spine scopes a little bit. And then the guy handed us the range finder and he's, he's like, yeah, this is new. It's got image stabilization. And, and I was like, well, what, <laughs> like, what do you mean he's got image stabilization? Yeah. You know, we took the technology from our cameras and put it into here. So you, you turn it on and you know, you just put it up to your eye and before you press the power button, it's just like any other range finder, super shaky image, press the power button and then it pops up your little, uh, you know, dot that you can aim with. And basically, image stabilization stabilization turns on. So wow. you can, I mean, hand holds. It's got a six x uh, magnification on it. I mean, you can hold a hundred yards and basically like hold on a quarter. Dang. Uh, 
it is incredible. Which if anybody, I mean, that, I've been in that scenario so many stinking times um, where I'm cold or adrenaline or something's going on and I'm shaking so stinking bad that you can't get a good range. Yeah. Especially if you're shooting like for a fi- like a small window between branches or whatever. So then you got to like set your bow down and use your other hand to hold it, kind of stabilize it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this thing's, yeah, it's incredible, man. One-handed operation, crazy steady image. I was freaking blown away by it. Huh. Um, about the only thing I noticed was, at least indoors there, the optics seemed a little bit darker, which would make sense to me. You know, it's probably not um, how that lens inside is constructed. Um, it's probably not going to be like, you know, that Leopold range I use now. Um, it's got, you know, pretty dang good optics in it. Um, and this was definitely darker. So I think in, in twilight, low-light situations would be... A little, um, you know, I mean, not quite as nice, but I think it's still plenty bright enough you can see what's going on. So, yeah, um, I didn't. Uh, they're gonna, we're gonna get some samples and do some more testing. That we didn't dive really in deep to it. I, I know it's got all your incline decline measurements and everything in there. And um, yeah, I'm super excited to check that out some more. Yeah, that sounds awesome. So, it was funny. Uh, as you know, Steve, I brought my buddy Jared his first time ever to the ATA show, and as you mentioned, it's kind of like. If you've been there and done that, you don't get, you know, as super excited and can't hit everything or necessarily even want to hit everything. Right. Um, but I was interested to see like what his perspective would be first time being there. And, uh, you know, we were there a half a day. Uh, and he said, you know, one thing he realized from being there was just how much stuff he didn't need because it, it's one of these deals where, like <laughs> there's a product for everything, right? But in mm-hmm. the end, what do you actually need? And do you get caught in this trap of thinking you need to buy this just because it's new and just because it has some sort of benefit? When in reality, kind of like what you're saying, Steve, like you know what you have, you know what works, you know what you need, and that's pretty much it. Um, and I think that's huge, like a huge lesson, a huge takeaway to all of the listeners who think that like gear is the answer or you know it's the new year and tax returns coming around and they're getting stoked for you know next fall's hunts and it's at this time of year it's very often like gear 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 is what's on the mind um Mm -hmm. but so much of that just either isn't necessary or we should be spending more time energy effort and thought into other places that could make our hunts better and not just researching gear you know yep yeah, for sure. I think it's um, it's, it's almost a I hate to say this, a, a, but it's almost the a, the lazy approach to um, becoming a better hunter, right? It's easy to sit on the couch and start researching new gear, and and all, I'm you know I'm freaking I'm guilty as anyone is doing this. I'm I'm already thinking about the you know some new stuff I want to try out this year as far as backpack and stuff goes, and um, but it's it's a lot easier to do that and assume better quality gear is going to make you a better hunter than to focus on some of the stuff like a getting yourself in better shape, um, or eating healthier or, uh, you know, researching hunting methods and tactics, um, you know, and spending time out in the field. That's kind of the harder stuff to do. Uh, and that's at the end of the day, um, you know, it, we've had how many, like, uh, like great guests we've had on here that all come like with Kleckner. Um, you know, he's just like, it's all the shooter, right? Like right. these guys can geek out on whatever $5,000 rifle they want. Um, but it, it all comes down to the shooter and, and, um, you know, the same deal, right? I mean, if, if you want to be a successful hunter, um, it all comes down to, to you and, and what's going on between your ears when, when you're on a stock or something. So, yeah. um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's interesting, you know, for sure. Yeah. I think there's this direct correlation to in like the, I don't know, like the process of getting into hunting and especially getting into like backcountry hunting where the earlier on you are, the more focused you're on gear, but then the more you go and then Mm -hmm. the more, you know, you realize the less that you actually need. Right. And I think that's a natural like evolution, but I think it's interesting that if you, if you focus on how much you get out there and how much experience you have, you're cutting that like learning curve short and that whole process short. And so like part of me is just thinking, just focus more on getting out there and getting experience with what you do have. And that experience will either teach you 
what you need to get or what you have that you don't actually need. But to sit back and do that, you know, by reading forums or something like that, like you're just, you're just at the will of somebody's opinion, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, it's only until you get out there and do the thing that you actually truly know what you do and don't need. And obviously, you know, you can't test every hunting specific thing in the off season, but you can test a whole lot of stuff right now in terms of, you know, clothing and just water filters and all kinds of gear that relate to the pursuit. Like that should be tested now in the off season. And it's another mm-hmm. excuse to get out there for sure. But I just want to, you know, encourage all the listeners and even remind myself of that process of doing it and walking through that is much more helpful than just reading about it. Somebody else's opinion and experience and all that. Right. Yeah. It's a, um, yeah, it's kind of an inter- I mean, it's, it's funny as you were saying that earlier, like the first, uh, whenever someone calls and they're say they're coming out West on their first backpack hunt and they're asking about like 35 or 5,500, it's always like, well, 5,500. Cause for the first two, three years, you're going to pack way more crap than you would ever going to need. You know, yeah. you're, you're going to, it just takes time to figure out what you need and what you don't need, you know, and, and some guys, some guys never, um, you know, some guys never evolve past that. They still pack a ton of crap, uh, that they really don't need and take all that extra weight. Um, and I, and I guess that's, you know, each person's preference. Um, you know, for me, obviously I've gone to super minimal lightweight and I basically pack the bare essentials and, uh, and I'm okay with discomfort back there. But, um, you know, at the same time, we're saying all this good gear obviously makes a huge difference. Like I've said, packs and boots and, um, you know, those are two things that are critical. And, and uh, I just did a, um, a podcast with a guy. It was his podcast and I was on it. And it's he's a professional photographer. Um, and he had made the statement in that podcast um, that he said because he'd come from the Portland area. And he said, um, he's like, I quickly learned that there's no such thing as bad weather, just bad clothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and it, it is a very true statement, right? I mean, good, yeah. good clothing, good waterproof gear, um, you know, keeps you out there longer. So it's, um, I guess like I said, you go through that process. It's going to take a couple of years of figuring out what works and what doesn't work. And then I th- think once you get to the point, you know, it works, uh, like for me, I know what, what works, what doesn't, um, to start and I'm doing a lot less, uh, gear reach on the latest tents and sleeping pads and stuff like that than, uh, years back. Yeah. yeah. I mean, one final thought I had on that too is just in in one way, researching gear, shopping about gear, getting new gear, whatever, like that helps us be attached to the experience. Like we feel like we're doing part of this thing that we love because we're preparing, we're geeking out, we're doing research. Mm-hmm. But that's just one way to do it. And especially in this off season, man, let's not like make the experience all about getting online and reading about stuff let's just get out and have some sort of related actual experience and get outside so like you said like i don't want this to be a rant of anything other than we've been there done that we can relate and we're even reminding ourselves you know yeah cool let's uh let's wrap up with hitting some q and a and this was not planned but i guess this somewhat relates to your minimal style steve so this is a question that we got from uh, a listener alan and he said he heard one of the born and raised guys mention that Steve is a wizard when it comes to setting up and packing up his camp. Can mm. you guys share some tips to effectively set up and break down camp? Do you have a set system or just throw it all in the bag? Yeah, that's a great, I actually learned basically everything I learned. I learned from Lenny. Um, and he's going to be so of... glad that we have that recording. <laughs> he's going to loop that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's, a, um, for me, it's minimal gear, right? Like the less crap I have, the less crap that's laying on the ground in the morning as I'm loading up my pack, getting ready, um, you know, that the better, the faster I can get loaded up and go. Uh, if you got, you know, 20 more items than I do, that's just 20 more things. You got to find what place they go to and stuff like that. So minimal gear. Um, and then it's just a process and a system of there's little things you can do, um, and, and, so, like my old sleeping pad, the, the new Sea to Summit one had a the valve just like quick dumps all the air, which is freaking awesome. But for me, a, a thing I used to do was um, wake up in the morning and then as soon as I sat up and, and started drinking my coffee, I'd, I'd ter- 
turn the valve on my sleeping pad and let that start deflating. Because most guys know that, you know, it takes like 45 seconds to freaking squeeze all the air that when you're trying to fold it up. So just like flipping that valve, letting the air go out while you're doing other stuff. That way when you go to roll it up, it's just like, bam. Um, and then it, it's that we encourage you guys to do this is have that system of everything goes in the exact same place every single time. And that, and that doesn't mean you need, you know, deep pockets. That's just how you load the pack. So for me, um, the very first thing in the bottom of it is my sleeping bag and then it's going to be my sleeping pad and then it's going to be my tent and then it's going to be my clothes and then my food. Um, and then extra socks, I guess would go up on top. My stove is going to go right inside the side zipper. Bam. The inside of my packs loaded up. I'm ready to go. Uh, and then I've got, you know, depending on the hunt, spine scope and tripod and trekking poles and tent poles that would get put in the outside pockets. Um, so it's just, yeah, it's just being efficient at it. And I think, you know, it's kind of been, uh, oh, and then no stuff sacks. I forgot that's the, that's probably the biggest one is we're not taking the time to take my sleeping pad, roll it all up, put it in a stuff sack. You're kind of wasting time getting it in there. You're taking your sleeping bag, you're throwing it in a stuff sack, you're throwing your tent in a stuff sack. You got a stuff sack for your water filter and stuff sack for this and that. Um, we just kind of let our, how we pack the load, the pack, do the organization for us. Um, and then strategically put things in places. Like I said, my, my headlamps always in the lower right stretchy pocket. My water filter is always in the lower left stretchy pocket. My TP is in that lower left stretchy pocket. Um, you know, everything's kind of always in the same place. So it's very, when I'm loading up in the morning, it happens very, very fast. Cause I know the, 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 the order in which I'm doing it and where everything goes. So, um, I guess that's probably most of it, but it, it does when we're out there, and we go backpacking with with you know Cody and Trent when we're filming Land of the Free series. I mean, we're we're packed up and loaded up, and the packs are on our back, and like their tent's still up, you know, because <laughs> they're still <laughs> squeezing the air out of the sleeping pad or something like that. And that and that's just from our, you know, um, you know, we're just been forced to backpack in Idaho to find good hunting, and we've been uh, and then forced again from setting up a base camp to packing up every single morning. Uh, and taking camp with us all day long. So it just, you know, we've done that, that repetition over and over and over again. Um, and, uh, found our, found our systems and processes that work for us, you know? So, um, I guess, yeah, it, it works for us. Not, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, the next guy swears by using a stuff sack for this or that, but, um, I at least encourage people to try the way that we're doing it. Um, cause I imagine that you won't go back. So, yeah. And I did, uh, it's funny you asked that question because we did that um, back in October. I was on a short rifle hunt and did a video on uh, how to how to load up a 3500, 5500, and then compress it for day hunting. And then I talk about not using stuff sacks. And there's been a couple comments like, "Well, what do you do when your tent's wet?" And I'll actually just take the fly and I'll throw it in this front stretch pocket. Um, and then midday, if I'm sitting down glassing or taking a nap or whatever. I can just one zipper, pull the fly out. I'll, I'll lay it out on the rocks, let the sun hit it, dry it out, and then I'll just go throw it in the main pack. So um, that's definitely uh, about the only thing I could see. Because it really, if you the opposite side of that is if you got your tent it's soaking wet, you throw it in the stuff sack. The body of your tent's going to get soaking wet with the fly. It's going to be compressed in this stuff sack that's semi waterproof. Certainly, no air is getting in there to dry anything out. So by that evening, if, if you didn't take the time to dig it all the way out of the bottom of your pack, uh, that evening you go to set up your tent, it's just going to be just as soaking wet as it was in the morning. So um, that's one uh, that's a, one question I keep getting on that on our method, and, and I actually think it's uh, a superior way to do it. So Right. Yeah, if you guys uh, just go to youtube.com forward slash XO Mountain Gear, and you guys will see that, as Steve mentioned, uh, I think the video is like how to properly load your uh, 55 or 3,500 pack for a multi-day trip. So that one's on there right on YouTube. Um, and yeah, it's 10 minutes of walking through and showing exactly kind of the process you described. Yeah. And I think people would be, uh, people would be surprised, surprised by watching that video and just see how little gear there really is that's in our pack. Yet I have absolutely everything I need. I usually have stuff where I, where I know I could be out there for a couple days longer. Um, and you know, it's just a lot of uh, using using the same thing for multiple uses, uh, not packing extras of stuff that you're really never going to need. And you know you don't need two pairs of underwear. There's just no reason for it. Even if even if you fell in a creek and your underwear got soaking wet, uh, it, it's going to dry out in about an hour, right? If you're if you got put pants over the top of it and you're hiking up a hill. So um, 
there's uh yeah i think it's uh i encourage people to get to get lighter weight i think there's um uh an interesting, you know, the, the amount of energy expenditure, um, I, w- I would love to get someone scientific on here to say exactly what that is, you know, but I, I know, I mean, even taking half a pound off your footwear, right? Like do the math on doing five, 10,000 steps a day that that number adds up to a lot of extra weight lifted. Um, and I think that's just a lot more fatigue. So I, I know since I've been going lighter and lighter and I pack up camp every single morning, uh, I think I burn, you know, a third as many calories as I used to where we'd have heavy packs and, and then hike up and down the hills and every evening you're, you know, way up on top of the mountain, your camp's in the bottom. So you spend an hour and a half getting back down to your camp and the next morning you're hiking back up there. Um, definitely just, uh, it's a great way to hunt. Yeah. Cool. So another, uh, listener question was from Justin and he said he, he went out West for one year, um, didn't really talk about his experience, but he was just really asking about maps, online resources, and et cetera, to find uh, not only trails, but trailheads and kind of access points. Um, I know for me, that question, the answer to that question is different now than it was, say, six years ago. Um, you know, back then I was trying to get all kinds of crazy different data sources, anything I could find. I'd try and get that into Google Earth. Sometimes that worked well. Like you could just import uh, KMZ or KML or whatever format you had and Google would open it. Other times I was quite literally taking, you know, uh, topographic maps and images and then like trying to transpose it onto Google Earth and do all this crazy magic stuff. And really the, the game has changed so much in the last, like I said, five years or whatever. Um, you know, now there's there's all kinds of resources. Um, but really the one I keep coming back to is on X maps. Um, and there's, there's so much data in there and there's so much more data in there year after year that that's kind of become my default go-to for everything. And then I will just use other data sources to kind of do double checks or secondary references, but you know, and there you're going to have trails, uh, you're going to have roads, trail heads, public access, private access. I mean, there's, there's so much there that for me, that's just like the go-to. And I find that 95% of the time it has exactly what I'm looking for. Um, and usually more than I even need, but any other, any other thoughts on that, Steve? Yeah. Yeah. So I've just, um, really since this I started using Onyx here in September this year and, um, I found the interface a little complicated, but like you said, it does so stinking much. Um, in the past, I've used um, the, the the Delorme, which Garmin now, uh, their inReach, just their their mapping software, and really liked it. Uh, it was very simple, basic, um, but Onyx is is pretty incredible. Like when we were hunting Colorado, uh, Cody would turn on the fire layers, and we could literally hunt, you know, the the perimeter of the burn. Uh, you know, seem to be a lot of elk right on the fringes there. And, um, you could kind of see like, okay, it's coming up in a quarter mile or a hundred yards away. It was really impressive. Um, private land access being, I mean, there's, uh, in fact, I was just on my phone the other day in, in an area where I've always wanted to elk hunt that I thought was landlocked by private. I pulled it up and sure enough, there's like a 20 yard slit where there's some public land I can sneak through. Score. Um, and yeah, I was like, holy crap, I'm going to, I'm going to go check that out here this summer and scout in there. So, uh, yeah, that's an amazing tool. Uh, yeah, for, for me, it's been, uh, like you said, a checking a series of multiple sources, um, you know, between Google earth being the main one, uh, I know like if I'm in Idaho, we have our Idaho fishing game has a hunt planner map center, uh, some really good maps in there. There's another, uh, resource, um, called, I believe, holy crap. It's like trails.idaho.com. Um, and that has basically all the trails on it. Um, and then unfortunately it's a different resource. Say like you're, uh, if I'm bear hunting and I'm looking for a closed road, you're not going to see that on a topographic map. And then you got to call national forest office and find out what roads are, or aren't open. And, um, it's kind of a, yeah, you got to do a lot of, you know, you got to find five or six different sources usually to kind of narrow it down. So, um, my one advice to that guy is avoid trailheads, though. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> like, what I was yeah. going to say. <laughs> it's like, 
I think I, when I first started backpacking, that's your very first instinctive thing. Like, go to the furthest trailhead away from pavement uh, that you can find. And, you know, I, I you drive for like freaking two hours and only see a couple of rigs. Then all of a sudden you pull up to this trailhead and I'm like, bam, there's freaking eight party. trucks parked there. And you're like, ah, uh, what the crap? So clearly everyone had the same thought. Um, and usually, I think we've said it before, some of our best hunting spots are literally – uh, you park off the side of a highway or something like that, and then and go hike up two, three thousand feet and hunt country that nobody even touches. So, uh, encourage people to to look for stuff like that. You don't have to hit a trailhead and hike eight miles back there necessarily. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, trails. I I say this not being derogatory because I've been there, done that. I'm talking to myself, but trails are such a crutch, especially for guys who are going into country that they're not familiar with and that they're hunting from out of state or from halfway across the country. Um, you just feel that much more secure going, I'm going to an actual place. It's an actual trail that's on a map. Right. Um, I can access it, you know, it, it, it's, but in the end, uh, again, pretty much everybody and their brother has the same thought. Um, and that doesn't say you shouldn't ever go to a trailhead, but get creative. Um, you know, as you just mentioned, Steve, sometimes it's like just this pull off off the side of the road and crossing, you know, the body of water that nobody wants to cross and then making this brutal climb up and over this ridge that nobody wants to climb that doesn't have a trail. And then you're in a freaking wonderland. Um, so yeah, look at trailhead. Sure. But man, think outside the box too. So yeah, for sure. Uh, an interesting question just because I don't see it get a ton of talk but tyler was asking about thoughts on a tent versus a hammock for out west have you ever done any ah. hammock time steve <laughs> I, I have, have. have you? <laughs> yeah i have yeah so what are your thoughts um uh, i when i very first started getting the backpack and i was like i stumbled across hennessy hammocks and um i thought holy crap that's like that sounds amazing um scouted a few trips with it was a little cold you know i, I think Back then, um, I had a Marmot Hydrogen 20, 15 or 20 degree? 15. Um, 15 degree bag, was a little cold. Um, tried to sleep it on, I was sleeping like I had a, a three quarter length thermo rest pad that I tried to sleep it on, but it kept sliding out from one side or the other inside the hammock and um, slept okay and then went hunting and it was like early September and it got down to, uh, like I think 20 degrees, so you know, high, high teens, low twenties. Um, and I think how I had pitched the hammock, my feet were slightly elevated. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I couldn't feel my feet, I think for like four hours that morning, literally from like <laughs> the knee down, there was no blood flow and, and I had fallen, you know, obviously slept all night and they, my feet got so stinking cold that it was like walking with like literally like frozen cubes of ice uh each boot was just a, a solid cube is what it felt like you know there's no feeling um and basically past that I've, I've i've used them very very sparingly it's been you know six seven years since i've used one i, I still got it in my uh in my gear bin um but uh, i know there's uh um some under hammock quilts that you can get that give you insulation on the bottom side um i think there's some stuff you can do but i kind of uh um, looked past it I, I will say i remember like it was amazing because the, the couple times i used like on the scouting trips i was literally sleeping on the side of a mountain oh you know like you it's way easier to find like a big rock and a tree to tie a hammock to than it is a, a flat spot in the ground so mm -hmm. um, that part of it was incredible yeah. what was your experience uh i've had some absolutely fantastic nights in a hammock uh when the weather's been good <laughs> like some <laughs> of the some of the most enjoyable and like quality rest i've ever gotten outside has been in a hammock um but like you if the temperature drops it's just hard to stay insulated in a hammock um there's so much airflow obviously underneath you if you're taking the standard approach as you mentioned of just climbing in a sleeping bag sounds great but then you're just compressing all of the insulation underneath you and then underneath that is nothing so as, as you mentioned steve most guys who are Trying to go with the hammock route with cold weather, end up doing an under quilt, uh, which keeps your lower side warm, but then you still need uh, a quilt or, you know, some other sleeping bag on top of you. In the end, it sounds amazing. It sounds simple. It sounds light. But once you piece together the system that I think you would need to confidently and comfortably hunt 
during most hunting seasons, um, you're not any lighter or more simple than a shelter. And in fact, it's probably the opposite yeah. um, from a ground-based shelter. That said, yeah. they can be incredibly comfortable. Um, right. But yeah, I, I've never done one for a Western hunt. Haven't really thought about it, but I still use mine on backpacking trips and other uh, fair weather mm-hmm. trips, if you will. The other thing nice. too, like with the hammock is, you know, again, so you think, okay, I got the hammock, I got the suspension, that's all light and that's all simple. Now I'm probably going to need an under quilt. Now I'm going to need some other insulation for my body. Then I'm going to need a tarp or some other sort of covering. Like you get to build the system that again is not any more simpler. And then just think right. through uh, the livability factor. So a lot of the hammock uh, tarps out there provide great coverage if you're laying in the hammock, but don't provide great coverage for anything else. So then if you're dealing with bad weather, um, you know, rain, or you want to sit and have good cover for cooking, stuff like that, like there's just, there's a lot of other issues that go into uh, that whole system. That said, I think they're cool, uh, just not for hunting for me. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, it's funny, man. Yeah, it's, uh, I'm pretty much the exact same thoughts. I've, I've looked at it. I see it every year and I'm like, ah, I should, I'll just try that again once, you know, maybe I'll go scouting and bring it out this year. And like I said, the complexity that, um, uh, and, and then you'd have to, you have to take a, you know, a big trash bag or something like that to put your boots and, uh, extra clothes. And you just don't have that tent space inside of you to, to spread your gear out and yeah. wake up in the morning. You're not making coffee inside the hammock and sitting there drinking it. And, um, yeah, definitely awesome for fair weather and, uh, I'm sure there's some, I know there's some hammock experts out there that are just like, you, you know, freaking grinding their teeth right now and <laughs> cursing our names saying we don't know what we're talking about. But, Email uh, us. We'll get you on yeah. the show. You can correct yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, please. Let's, let's <laughs> chat. <laughs> yeah, cool. Uh, um, all right, let's do one more uh, and then yeah. we'll have to do some more Q&A episodes down the line for sure. So this one, uh, Tom was writing in asking about the pros and cons of a water bladder versus a water bottle system. Oh, I like this um, one. He mentioned a water bottle and put in parentheses such as Nalgene. I will say there's other bottle options that I would look at for Nalgene, but anywho. Um, he said he always thought a bladder was better, but he's had trouble with hoses freezing up um, during you know mid-October elk hunts, for example. So bladder versus bottle, let the games begin. <laughs> this is an interesting one to me because I... Um, I get the bladder tube freezing. Yeah, that issue pops up, but, uh, I'll, I guess I'll preface this with I've never hunted with an algae bottle. Um, so maybe they are the cat's meow. Maybe I need to freaking stuff a sock in my mouth and go try one. Um, but I just don't like, I mean, say a mule deer hunt, we pack like six liters of water with us at any given time. So I don't know what, I guess I don't know how many Nalgene bottles you got to take to do that. Or you just have one bladder that you fill up on the inside and then you just refill your Nalgene as you go. Um, I guess I could see that scenario. Um, the, if the, these Nalgene bottles where you got the, the pocket on the outside, I have to imagine that water splashes around and makes a bunch of noise. Maybe I'm crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know. I just don't, I don't like that for, for one second on the death hike a few years ago, a guy, um, he uh, had Nalgene, he had like four or five Nalgene bottles in his pack. And <laughs> I mean, just the, the freaking amount of those bottles alone, the weight of it was like a pound. Yeah. Um, I was like, what the hell? Uh, so I don't know. I don't get it. We we're asked a lot for a Nalgene bottle pocket. Um, yeah, it's one of those things Lenny and I struggle with. We, we don't really like designing and doing something that we don't personally use cause it's, you know, but the passion's not there for the product. So it's kind of a tough one for us. Um, I'd love to hear some thoughts. I understand the, the freeze in the tube thing, I'll throw a easy, easy tip out there for everyone this happens to once you're done drinking, simply blow back through the tube. You're going to push all the water back into the bladder. There's no water in your tube. It won't freeze. Yeah. Uh, that's all I do. When it's cold weather. Air. It's not an issue at all. Yeah. So yeah, I, man, I get appeal to the bottles. I've never gone bottle exclusively, but I use water bottles all the time. Uh, for hunting, for things like the death hike and all the above. So pro tip to you XO users out there and maybe to some other packs, but I can only speak from experience here. Get a uh, smart water brand water bottle, like at a gas station or at Walgreens or wherever, 
uh, pay the buck fifty or two bucks. They are tall and they are skinny and they fit incredibly well in the side stretch pockets of the pack. And since they're tall and skinny, they're super easy to take uh, out of the pack while you're wearing it and to put back in one-handed, no big deal. They also, the threading on those will fit the Sawyer filters, so you could uh, filter dirty straight from it. Or another thing I like to do is um, they fit a lot of the common like uh, pop-up caps. So if you want, you know, instead of like threading or unthreading to take a drink, you can do a little pop-up thing as well. So I use those water bottles all the time, uh, mostly for uh, anything like flavoring or electrolytes or anything I'm adding to water. I do it in those bottles because I just don't like adding stuff to my bladder. Um, thus far, the bladder has still been like primary water carriage and even drinking um, go-to for me, but that, that smart water bottle is always there. I've thought about going and basically just carrying a bladder for dirty water when I need to load up and then running, uh, you know, maybe even two smart water bottles and either filtering straight from those or, you know, filtering into those. Haven't done that. I don't know that I will, but I definitely see the appeal of having a bottle again, especially for adding electrolytes or any other uh, of those things. So yeah, I, I use them all the time. The smart water bottles, they're, you know, like I said, I pick one up essentially before every trip at a gas station, but I bet you I could reuse one for like years. Um, uh, and they're way, way, way lighter than an Nalgene and they're going to fit much better, um, in an exo pack than an Nalgene. So if you do want a bottle, uh, that's definitely how I'd go about it. I don't know that I could go bottle exclusive. Um, there's so many conveniences yeah. to the bladder though. I st- yeah. I still don't understand how, like, I mean, if you're backpacking, you, you're, you gotta have, I mean, you're going to have, you know, we, f- we fill up our three liter bladders and then we top off. Uh, I mean, we always have extra bladders that we top off whenever we can. Like I said, mule, mule deer hunting is the extreme example because you get up on top of the peaks, there's just no water up there and you're sure. it's way easier to pack six liters up than drop back down to get another three, you know, the yeah. next day. Yeah. You'd um, either, you'd have to carry a bladder you'd have that to was carry a bladder or and just pick up water and then filter it later, yeah. or you would yeah. have to fill up a bladder and then at that water source, sit there and gravity feed or push feed or whatever, and then filter a whole bunch of water into another water bladder. But yeah, you can't, like you literally can't carry enough in just bottles without getting ridiculous. Yeah. That, that, I guess that's the part, right? Uh, so love to anybody out there listening. That's a hardcore Nalgene bottle guy email us and let us know your thoughts we'll, uh, we'll include it in the next time we do a q a because yeah. i it's uh, <laughs> i still can't wrap my head around it yeah it just doesn't make sense if you're a water bottle hammock expert we can kill <laughs> two birds with one stone it'll be awesome there we go <laughs> okay cool let's wrap this up uh, again listeners if you have any other questions uh anything random like these have been or hunting specific anything in the above uh, shoot us to podcast at com. We'll get you guys in the queue. I was going to say, I'll throw this out there too for a mention at the beginning of the show. Um, as far as we get a lot of emails this year on what shows we're going to be at and, and really XO, we're such a small company that we can't be at all the shows that are out there. Um, you know, some guy was upset that we're going to the Pennsylvania sportsman show and I was like, holy crap. Yeah, that's, that's way out of the realm of what we could possibly do. But, um, we do, we'll be at the uh, Utah hunt expo, which is coming up in a few weeks. Uh, we'll have packs at the Portland, uh, sportsman show. I think it's Pacific Northwest sportsman show. Uh, that's coming up at the exact same time as the hunt expo. I'll personally be there, um, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, we'll have a couple of XO pro staff guys running the booth Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, and then the Boise sportsman show, we'll just have uh, a pack at, uh, a friend of mine works for the uh, NWTF. So we're gonna have a pack there. People can come by and look at, uh, that's the Idaho sportsman show. So, other than that, uh, we got our 30-day return policy, so we make it super easy for someone to order a pack. And um, if if it's, you know, our return rate is like half of one percent, uh, but <laughs> if you are one of those people that the pack just isn't quite working for you, uh, you send it back, cost you 10, 15 bucks, and, and that's all you're out. So yeah, uh, yeah, those will be the shows that we're at. Sweet, come see us. All right, catch you guys later. <laughs>